This is the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 70, Why Everything You Know About Food Is Wrong, with guest Kevin Geary, founder of RebootedBody.com. Let's go. Welcome back, Liberty Entrepreneurs Nation, and thanks again for tuning in. I'm your host, Ash, and this is episode 70. As you may know, I packed up my life and decided to travel the world and currently in Budapest, Hungary, but the show must go on. Great thing about having an online business is that I can literally be anywhere in the world that has a strong internet connection and keep the wheels turning. Today's guest is Kevin Geary, founder and CEO of RebootedBody.com, and I've known Kevin for a couple years and he has a very interesting story. Basically, while running a karate studio, Kevin found himself overweight and his doctor told him that he was about to be diabetic if things didn't change. So after listening to this and taking his doctor's advice, he followed the prescribed exercise routine and the government's food pyramid and it didn't work. He says he dieted himself up to 230 pounds or so. Eventually, he decided to take a different approach to his own personal health. If you've ever struggled with dieting or tried and failed with exercise, then this episode is definitely for you. Now, the Liberty Advocates that listen to this show will be quite pleased to hear how Kevin and I dissect and dismantle much of what we learned in school regarding health and what incentives may have actually been present to cause our overwhelming misunderstanding of what it means to live a healthy life and then nourish our bodies with real natural food. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Kevin, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Man, I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah. So Kevin, fill in the gaps for us. Who are you? What are you passionate about? And when did this whole freedom and entrepreneurship start becoming a thing for you? Yeah. So let's see. Um, Back in 2009, I went through a personal health transformation uh, up to that point. Well, I guess it, it all started. The catalyst was going to get a physical. My wife actually scheduled one for me because I hadn't had one since I met her. And uh, so I went and they told me that I had high blood pressure and I was a borderline diabetic. And at the time I was you know, 225-ish pounds, and which for me is about 60 pounds overweight. And I had, I, I tell people I dieted up to that weight because I was doing a lot of calorie restriction and excessive exercise, basically the mainstream approach to dieting. And I would have some success in the short term and then I would crash and binge and gain that weight back plus more. And I just kept repeating that process over and over and over again, stuck in this pattern of failure and frustration. And when you do that for long enough, you look up and you're very overweight and you're not very healthy. And the doctor tells you that you need to make some changes. And and I asked him actually in that appointment, I was like, okay, well, what do you recommend? And he basically told me uh, more of the same. You know, he said, eat less and and move move more. And I was like, well, that's what I've been trying to do. And none of that is working. So I left feeling even more frustrated. I I left kind of angry because, you know, these are the people who are supposedly the experts and they're supposed to be able to help you. And the advice that he was giving me was just, I mean, non-existent really. So I I started, you know, going out on my own and and searching for people who were saying something different. And I did come across a lot of people who were saying something different. And I started implementing a completely different approach. And so I I focused mainly on just eating real food. And I started learning about the the manipulation of our food supply. I started, uh, I, I went from excessive exercise to more functional exercise. And I started doing activities more along the lines of my passion and things that I love to do instead of just you know beating myself up with exercise. And I started paying attention to things like hormones and gut health and sleep and all of these other factors. And the more of the dots that I connected, the more success that I had. Of course, I also uncovered that I was struggling a lot with sugar addiction. Uh, I came to realize that I had a really poor relationship with food And so when I was looking for 
comfort or control uh, or just coping in general with lots of stress, I would turn to food in, in those cases. And I realized at that point that it doesn't really matter how much information you have about what to eat and how to move your body. It's, you know, the information doesn't mean you're actually going to execute or that you're going to be consistent. If you have a poor relationship with food, that really needs to be looked into and resolved in order for you to be successful in the long term. And so I, I did a lot of that work and I found a lot of great success and maintained that success. And at the time I was a martial arts instructor, you know, I, I didn't really have anything to do with the health and fitness industry. I was just doing my own thing. I was the co-owner of a martial arts studio uh, here in Atlanta. And the guy that I was working with, I just, you know, my partner was not a very good person and I just wasn't happy with the relationship. I also wasn't happy with the way the martial arts industry was headed. It was uh, selling out very, very quickly, especially the, the specific martial art that I was in, Taekwondo, and kind of all the related martial arts, karate, et cetera, the ones you hear about very often. Uh, those were all just becoming belt factories. And I was trying to oppose that from within, but you know, it, it, I wasn't effective. Um, the person I was working with had, you know, more than 50% ownership. Therefore, you know, whatever I thought was, you know, was, I could voice my opinion, but it didn't really matter. Right. right. And I could yeah. see that I, I didn't have a lot of control over where that was headed. And I started to look for a way out and the parents that were coming in and bringing their kids were watching me go through that transformation. And they started asking me questions and I started just helping them off, off to the side and they started getting great results. And we actually started putting a curriculum together and then it ended up going online because I had been doing stuff online since I was a teenager. Uh, and it all just happened very, very organically. So in, in 2013, we officially launched Rebooted Body. So yeah, let's take it back a little bit before 2013. That's whenever you officially launched your program and your company online. But what were you doing? Was it other than the Taekwondo or were you doing the Taekwondo uh, instructing full time or what was your life like before you became an entrepreneur? Yeah, no, I was, I was doing uh, Taekwondo full time. So I was the uh, co-owner of that studio, which also meant that I was managing the studio. I mean, in terms of the hours spent actually teaching on the mat, it was a, it was a fairly good gig. You know, I was working quote unquote, uh, in, in terms of being present there only like four to five hours a day. And now I was doing a lot of work outside of that. I was, cause I was doing the work on the website. I was doing marketing. I was doing photography for the studio. Like whenever we would uh, put an ad out, right. I would do photography for that ad. I would design the ad. I would, um, you know, put that, all that content on the website and on social media and so on and so forth. So, and, and then of course, answering emails from clients and, uh, following up with leads. So I was doing a lot of work outside of class as well, but that kind of stuff, I really didn't consider work because of being entrepreneurial. I, that stuff was fun to me. You know, all of that was like, it was like playing a game, you know, right. Uh, try and figuring try out a puzzle. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that part I, I loved and didn't mind at all. It was the being on the mat aspect that had some downsides. Uh, number one, because here you are uh, really passionate about what you're doing, really passionate about your students, but you're on the mat knowing that it's all going downhill and there's nothing you can do about it, you know, because like the quality aspect of it. And, you know, the more passion I put out there, the more effort I put out there, it's just being swallowed by this machine basically. And, you know, I was tied to a location and I was tied to hours. And because I was the only person, like we had some other assistant instructors, but because our, that location was so new, uh, they weren't really super capable of running the younger kids class. They could do the adult classes on their own. Uh, so every now and then I could escape for the last hour or so and go home a little bit early. But in terms of them teaching all of the classes, I mean, nobody could really do that except for me. So if that studio was going to be open, it was up to me. That meant no vacations. That meant, um, you know, unless I could get my partner to cover for me, but that was a hassle, right? Um, no time off really. And just no freedom, no autonomy. And I, I knew that 
the internet was the avenue for freedom for me personally. And I wanted to do something that was online. I wanted to do something that was location independent, that I could make my own hours. And so I was always looking to go that route. And, uh, you know, when, when everything came into alignment, the shift happened, uh, the, the personal transformation happened, it kind of offered that as an opportunity for me. And so your students, parents, and maybe your adult students would come up to you asking for outside resources, or if you could help them in your spare time, or what were they noticing? What, what was that demand starting coming, coming from them, which keyed you in on, Hey, there might be an opportunity here. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the general population, there's a lot of people that are overweight. The obesity epidemic continues to get worse and worse and worse. And so a lot of the parents are overweight and a lot of people are coming to martial arts as an activity to try to lose weight as well. That's what a lot of the adults are getting involved for. And so when they watched me uh, do this successfully, of course, they know a lot of people who find initial success, but not the kind of success that I had uh, in a huge transformation. They were just naturally interested and just started asking me what I was doing. And it wasn't anything that was like organized. It was just them asking uh, questions and I'd answer the questions for them in class or by some of them would email me. Some of them would hit me up on social media. And so I wasn't working with them, you know, in, in an organized way. I was just giving them some advice and the little bit of advice I was giving here and there, they were getting results from, uh, but they had more questions. And so we, when it reached a tipping point where there was like a certain number of people kind of noticing and asking questions, I was like, well, this would be better if we actually organize something here. And so I put together a curriculum and I just invited everybody, um, kind of, I just reached out to the email list of our, of that martial arts academy to the parents really. And I said, look, here's what I'm organizing. Do you, are you interested? Do you want to be in? And I ended up getting, I actually did it for couples. Uh, Cause at the time I, I wanted to like, I wanted the household to kind of be involved, not just uh, an individual person. So um, what we did is we opened it to, to couples and we got, uh, I think it was seven couples. So it was 14 people total said, yes, I want to do whatever curriculum you're putting together. And I also said, we'll meet at the studio once a week. So on Friday nights, we'll all meet here and we'll go over the next part of the curriculum. And then you guys go home and implement and the following week we'll take the next step and so on. And I can't remember how long I had designed that uh, curriculum for, uh, but that's what we did. We executed on it and, and people started getting great results. And I also noticed at that time working with people, they kind of had the same relationship with food issue that I had. Um, so giving them just the right information. See, at the time I thought like, I'm the only person that can have the right information and still fail. I'm the only person who has this issue with food. And it right. turns out that no, like most people have that issue. That's what that initial group taught me. So when I started to take everything online, I also started to go in the direction of not just dispensing health and fitness advice, but really diving deep into the psychology of health and fitness and the psychology of success in changing your body and changing your health. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit deeper. Uh, excuse the pun, but you know, as a, as someone who very much values relationships, I find at times the relationship with my own body can be one of the more difficult ones, especially because we live in a, a food processed world where it is high sugar, and you know, especially in the United States where things are just really convenient and there's a lot of food everywhere. And for the most part, food is really cheap and readily available. What did you really see? Like when, it, when it, looking back on it now, what did you see with your relationship with food? That was one of your biggest speed bumps. And do you see that similarly in other people or how variant is that? So that's a good question. And it's, it's a really complicated topic, but I think where we can start is let's take sugar. For example, a lot of people think, and, and really this goes into the, the realm of addiction and, and the realm of dependence on certain substances. And there's a lot to kind of clear up here so that people can have a better understanding of how all of this works. So with sugar, the, the narrative in the mainstream is that sugar is a drug and drugs have these chemical hooks 
where if you use the drug, they hook into your brain, you become addicted to them, and then you use them um, habitually, right? And your life starts to decline, you have a bunch of negative health outcomes, and, and so on and so forth. And so when people think about trying to be successful in changing their nutrition, they see sugar as one of the biggest obstacles. And when I say sugar, I also mean processed, hyper palatable foods, these foods that are designed to be very, very tasty, and they have a really awesome combination of sugar and salt and fat that you can't really find anywhere else in nature. And when you eat these foods, they do light up the reward center of your brain. And so this leads people to make the connection to addiction. And that's not really how it all works. Um, it's, it's a great story, but it's, it's, if you look at the research, there's a lot of problems there, a lot of things that need to be looked at more deeply. So what's really happening is sugar does have the ability to uh, make you physiologically dependent. So for example, if you just ate a whole bunch of sugar for weeks on end, and then you took away the sugar, you'd kind of feel awful. You know, you would go through withdrawals, you would have headaches, you would have really low energy, you would have a bunch of physiological symptoms. But that doesn't mean that you are addicted to sugar. So separating the addiction from the dependence, I think, is really, really important. People who are just dependent on something, like if you're dependent on caffeine, you take away the caffeine, you're also going to feel like crap. You're going to have the headaches. You're going to have the low energy. It might mess with your sleep. It might do some other things, give you anxiety, etc. cetera. Uh, that doesn't mean you're addicted to caffeine. So if you successfully go through that withdrawal period, and a lot of people do that, they're not still constantly craving caffeine. They're not looking for cra uh, caffeine in their life. Like they can just, they got through the withdrawal period and now they're fine. They go without coffee. They go without caffeine and they're, they're good to go. The people who are addicted to something, even though you go through the withdrawal period, it still calls your name uh, or something that's linked, like a related behavior or a related substance. Uh, so there's something called addiction transfer where you get rid of one addictive substance or behavior and you just switch to another one because that need for a medication, that need for a coping mechanism is still there. You've done nothing to change the underlying issue. Therefore, you're still looking for comfort, control, and coping. And if you can't get uh, sugar, for example, you reach for something else. Um, and this could not just be substances, it could be behaviors also. And so if you look at the majority of the population, uh, there are some people who just are dependent on sugar. They just eat a lot of sugar. And if you get them off of the sugar, they'll be successful. They go through withdrawal period and then they can just stay away from sugar pretty much. That's not the majority from what we can tell. So when we give, um, well, first of all, you dive into the research, you look at that, then you give people actual assessments, then you start working with people in real life and you start to see patterns emerge where you get people through the withdrawal period and life's okay for a little bit and then binges come in and they, you know, they go back to their old behavior suddenly right. uh, or seemingly out of nowhere. Um, or they tell you, you know, X happened in my life and I started craving sugar again, or uh, Y happened and I immediately looked for donuts and ice cream and, and hyper palatable foods. Um, so you see these links. And I think that's where it, the psychology becomes very important. The health and fitness industry treats this as if everybody's just dependent on sugar, as if everybody just needs to detox from sugar. And you'll hear these words all the time. You detox from sugar, you go through the withdrawal period and life will be okay. And you watch people actually implement that and you realize that's not how it works. Like, and people aren't okay. Even though they do successfully quote unquote detox from sugar, that doesn't mean they're gonna stay away from it long-term. Yeah, it's so interesting about this whole sugar thing, because I would say that most people, even just a couple of years ago, wouldn't really consider sugar a drug. Yeah, it may get them fat or it may slow them down or something, but it wasn't seen as a drug like you would say like marijuana or something is, right? But I'd like to talk about the government's food pyramid, Kevin, and how there's bread on the bottom and you eat eight servings of it every day. What's going on there? <laughs> Uh, what's going on is that they are, uh, they've been in bed with big agriculture for a very long time. 
and there's a lot of noted manipulation in the creation of the food pyramid. And um, I have to give you a link to a book recommendation. And I also had the author on my podcast. I'm just drawing a blank on the name of the book, but I can give you uh, a link to it that goes into great detail on the history of the food pyramid, the findings and the recommendations that were made to the US government and how those recommendations were completely manipulated to get to the food pyramid that they eventually released. And of course now they don't have a food pyramid anymore. They switched it to a, a plate, I think is where we're at now. It's called my plate. And you know, it's all based on the same manipulation. But yeah, the pushing of grains, uh, wheat products, um, being anti-fat, especially anti-saturated fat, uh, is all based on manipulated research and just giving specific industries preference over others for various reasons. Uh, but none of it is really linked to actual uh, health, actual nutrition. Um, I've, I've said many times, and many people agree with me on this, of course, the majority doesn't agree because the majority is uh, rather brainwashed, but um, you know, I'm not a lone voice or anything on this, but nutrition and health research in general, I feel, and many people feel, is one of the most manipulated fields of research in existence. There, it, there is very little you can trust in terms of health research. Uh, so it's, especially if it's coming from quote unquote official sources. Yeah. I was going to say, do you think that's because a lot of this research is subsidized by the state and, and occurs in either their, the industry of the people buying them off or in their universities, which I don't hold in very high regard. Both. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all linked, right? So yes, the government provides research funding and, uh, it's my experience that they are looking for specific outcomes. If you look at the journals where uh, research studies are published, they exclude a lot of uh, studies that don't reach certain conclusions. Uh, if you look at the licensing agencies, those are all controlled and linked to the government and um, agencies that are getting money from the government. So it's that everybody's in bed with everybody else. And, and I mean, this goes into the CDC, this goes into basically every area that you could imagine the manipulation reaches into, has its tentacles in. And, and therefore, you know, everybody's in bed with everybody. You don't know who to trust. And this is really one of the, the biggest, and I don't know if this is their end goal, but it's one of the biggest complaints of the people that I work with and, and who come to our site is, I don't know who to believe right? Everybody is confused. That's the end result of, of what's going on. Every single person is confused. On the one hand, you have a great amount of research saying that saturated fat is highly beneficial for you. You have the government saying saturated fat will kill you. So like, I mean, that's, you can't get more opposite. And, and if you look into even, uh, I, I did a podcast on this the other day, skin cancer and vitamin D and whether you should wear sunscreen or not. There's a lot of research that says that skin cancers and actually many types of cancers and chronic diseases are caused by a deficiency of vitamin D. If you go through the official channels and you listen to the official advice uh, from dermatologists, licensed dermatologists, they say, any amount of sun exposure basically is damage to the skin, like a tan, a base tan is damage to the skin that will lead to skin. Therefore, you have to lather yourself in chemical sunscreens and make sure that you don't get any exposure. And what right. do we have? We have a population who's deficient in vitamin D and we have, skin, we have skin cancer rates that are skyrocketing. So the official advice says, don't go in the sun. By the way, this is something that human beings have done for hundreds of thousands of years, gone forever, in the sun, yeah. forever right? Um, and, and you know, the, the sun is the giver of life for almost everything on, on the planet. We're supposed to stay away from it, says the licensed dermatologist. Yeah. Um, and by, while you're staying away from it, or in order to stay away from it, take these chemical substances and massage them into the biggest organ of your body, right? Um, this is a, a big problem for people. So you do something as simple as sunscreen and people are totally confused. Do I wear sunscreen? Cause that might kill me. Or do I not wear sunscreen? Cause that might kill me. And right. they have no idea what to do. 
Yeah, well, I'm sure they're going to make up for it as they take care of us through their socialized healthcare routine. That's incentives, just... right? You look at incentives and you start to see big issues. If if we eat the way that their food pyramid says and we get sick, they win, right? So they win right now because, um, or the you know, when they're in bed with big agriculture and they do things like, hey, you know, all those grains you produce, we'll tell everybody to eat those as the majority of their diet. Okay, and we'll give you kickbacks. And so they both win that way. And then guess what? When everybody gets sick, since they control healthcare or want to eventually control healthcare, they get to uh, they get to profit off of that as well. So there, there's no situation where they lose and we win. It's the consumer always losing. Yeah, so let's talk about the effects of good health and personal freedom. You know, on this show, we're all about entrepreneurship as a means for freedom, but you've combined health and entrepreneurship for to help people build their own freedom. In your own experience, how has becoming more healthy and actually understanding how your body works and the types of, I think you call it real food, uh, how has that helped you become more free as a person? Well, first of all, it keeps me out of doctor's offices. It keeps me out of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I feel better. I'm able to take care of my family through this method. Um, and of course, if you are sick, right? Like you're, you only have one body. And if you are sick and can't be productive, you can't take care of yourself. You can't take care of your family. You become dependent in a lot of ways. And uh, you know, people will fall into this state of dependence from time to time. And if they have a community around them who's willing to step in and take care of them and help them and get them back on their feet, that's a, a fantastic thing. But we don't really have that anymore, right? Instead, we have dependence on government where everybody that could help you already has 30%, 40%, 50% of their wealth stolen from them, can't really or doesn't really want to any longer step in and, and help you in the way that they could in the past. Uh, so you, you become dependent on the government. So being healthy keeps you out of that state. And that's, and that's really what we want, by the way. It's not about living longer. It's about living better. It's about being more mobile. It's about being more free, taking care of yourself, not being dependent on anybody else, and doing that as long as you possibly can. There, there's so many people right now who are in their 40s and they're like, yeah, you know, we're all gonna die. What they don't realize is that when they're in their 60s, they're gonna be totally dependent. They're gonna be on so many pharmaceutical drugs. They're gonna be in a, in a nursing home way before they ever should be. They're gonna be re relying on so many other people and probably the government. And that's not freedom, you know? Like, it, you should be independent and mobile well into your 70s and, and 80s and basically die of old age, you know, um, w but without being dependent on everybody. Uh, that would be the end goal. And in the meantime, while you're in your 40s, you can feel so much better, you can think so much clearer, you can be so much more productive, and you can be a lot happier as well. So many people have all these nagging ailments, like they've got these digestive issues, they've got skin issues, they've got aches and pains, and you know everybody uh, chalks this up to, oh, I'm just getting old, this is part of old age, but it's not. Like if you look at their diet, it's terrible. If you look at their lifestyle habits, they're terrible. And you take these people, like a, a lot of them will say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired feeling this way, what can you do for me? We switch them to real food, you switch them to functional movement, you start getting them to prioritize their sleep, get their hormones in order, you get their gut health better. And they feel tremendous and they feel so much different. They didn't even realize how horrible they felt before they made these changes. And they get to see the impact of all those prior decisions on their health and on their well being. And they realize how much happier they are going forward with a body that actually works and isn't in the process of self destructing and, and breaking down. Yeah, you said something along the lines of passionate exercising or exercising with your interests or something like that. What did you mean by that? Because I know that even me personally, um, somebody who is gradually starting to appreciate movement as a means to de-stress myself and allow my blood to, you know, leave my head and flow into the rest of my body as I, like many of the listeners of this show, work online or work behind a desk. And we spend a lot of time cranking and crushing numbers and solving problems in our heads, but we haven't, you know, I'll speak for, for me personally, I don't always take the time 
that I know my body appreciates to allow my brain to relax and my body to engage because I still see it at times as a chore. You know, what is this like passionate, passionate exercise or I can't remember, I can't remember the term you use, but what does that mean and how is it incorporated in a healthy lifestyle like this? Yeah, I think this is one of the most important concepts for people because like you just said, there's friction. Most people encounter friction and resistance when it comes to working out, when it comes to exercising. And the reason for that is their relationship with exercise and what they think exercise is supposed to be or should be. And it's based on what we've been told by the government, what we've been told by media, what we've been public told schools. by culture, what we've been told by public schools. Um, you know, in, in gym class, it's like, okay, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run the mile and we're going to time you. We're going to see how many push-ups you can do. We're going to see how many sit-ups you can do. Like uh, we're going to take you through the presidential fitness test, right? right? This is, this is like starts to be our view of exercise and working out. And as a kid, you're like, wait, this is, there's nothing fun about this, right? Like there's some people who like to run. So like maybe that part of the test appeals to them. That part of the fitness and exercise appeals to them. But by and large, it's not really something people consider to be fun. And we just continue to take this into adulthood. And the, the health and fitness industry tells us, hey, no pain, no gain, right? Like right, you, right. you need to be a, uh, dissolving in a pool of sweat to consider it a workout. You need to hire a personal trainer. They're going to take you through all these fancy uh, machines and they're going to put you through the the ringer and yada, 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 right? This is the standard that everybody uh, lives by. And my philosophy is why are we doing all of that when we could just do physical activities that we find to be fun and very enjoyable? And this is a concept uh, that I wrote on called Dwile to do what you love today. It's about creating a list of physical activities that you love and enjoy truly. And so let's, let's go back to the grade school kind of concept where if you ask people, or you ask kids, all right, do you guys want to do the presidential fitness test today or do you want to play dodgeball? Right. It's like, so what is everybody going to decide to do? Probably right. dodgeball or basketball or like some game, physical activity, sport, etc. that you give them as an alternate option. That's what they're going to choose. Now you have to ask, okay, is are those alternate activities a great way to stay in shape or not? Is that a good form of, of movement? Well, yes, like most sports, most physical activities that people love to do are functional. They translate to the real world. They burn calories. They uh, increase your blood flow. They, they do all of the things that this other type of exercise that everybody's trying to sell, you know, gyms, etc., cetera, um, give you. So why not do the things that you love and, and stop beating yourself up doing the stuff that you don't love? Like people buy P90X. And of course, like in the beginning, they're going to like it because it's new. And But you know, when you're on the 300th round of P90X, you kind of get to a point where you're like, ah, again, like you, there's so much resistance and friction to putting that DVD in and going through it again, because it really wasn't all that fun. Like it was exciting because it was new, but you're not passionate about P90X, you know, whereas you could be really passionate about tennis. So if you're really passionate about tennis, are you going to need, let's use key words again, are you gonna need willpower to play tennis? Are you gonna need discipline to play tennis? No, you just play tennis because you really like to play tennis. And if you're playing tennis two or three times a week, maybe you have a, a two hour match every Saturday because you're on a team, like this is really, really good exercise that you're racking up. And if you ask people who love to play tennis, how they feel about tennis. Like, why do you play tennis? They don't say things like, oh, I wanna lose weight. I wanna lower <laughs> my blood pressure. I wanna burn calories. No, they're like, right. I like the people I play with. I have fun. I'm competitive. I do this, I do. Those are real reasons that people stick with physical activities, where physical activities become actual habits. Nobody sticks to something because they're losing weight or they're lowering their blood pressure or anything else. Those are, those are very superficial reasons for doing something. So you have this epidemic of people who's like, I need more willpower. I need more discipline. And, and my response is, no, you don't need more of those things. You need to do activities you actually enjoy. And when people really take that to heart and they change their behavior patterns and they go back to activities they actually enjoy, they find that, hey, 
uh, you're right. I don't, I don't need willpower. I don't need discipline. And the more activities you have in your back pocket or on that list that I talked about, the more variety you can create. Because the truth is that motivation ebbs and flows. So your motivation for tennis is not always going to be high. You might have, you might get into a period where you've, maybe you've played uh, too much tennis lately and your motivation is low. If you have two or three other activities to choose from, your motivation for one of those other activities is going to be quite high, uh, most likely. So you switch, you do that other activity for a while. There's no harm in that. Nobody said you had to play tennis for the rest of your life, right? It's just about what serves you best at the current moment. Yeah, I don't remember anyone in gym class in elementary or middle school asking me what I wanted to do. It was come in here, do what I'm going to tell you to do, you know, because I say this is good for you. There's there's no real creativity or interest in learning what I wanted to do. Maybe I wanted to play kickball one day. Maybe I wanted to play dodgeball. I can remember specifically dodgeball and basketball being like some of my favorite things to do in gym. And I thought it was kind of like a day off of gym class whenever we got to do that stuff. It yes, was like right? a, a free day, a recreation day. Like I couldn't wait, you know, rather than the monotonous routine of soldier training that they would put us through for the other four days a week or so. Um, but I guess that might be a, a bit of a different conversation here, Kevin. I'd like to dive back into uh, RebootedBody.com. Tell us a little bit about that. I know that this we started the podcast with Rebooted Body, and I'd like to start wrapping up here with it. Um, what have you learned through having your website and having this online business for the past, what, about four years now? Yeah, yes, definitely. And, and who is like your ideal client? So my ideal client is somebody who has bought into the, the dieting model for a very long time. So we, we are very interested in rescuing people, so to speak, from the dieting model, from the cycle of failure and frustration, because that's something that I was stuck in and I realized how frustrating it is for people. And I look around at the landscape of human health and I realize that we are struggling mightily uh, we are losing the battle against obesity and preventable disease. The health and fitness industry has a 95% long-term failure rate. Uh, the average person tries four to five diets um, and really not like they don't try them long-term. They might just jump from one to the other. I mean, somebody might be on a diet for a week before they abandon it and try a new thing. So I think the average is like four to five times a year. Uh, they'll do detoxes. They'll do cleanses. They'll do diets. They'll do this. They'll do that. Um, hire a personal trainer, change gyms, et cetera, et cetera. So rescuing people from that chaos and from that madness. I think what we can boil it down to is we help people get a body and life they love without feeling miserable in the process. Because if you talk to enough people, that's the common denominator is they have a relationship with health and with exercise, with anything to do with wellness in terms of like they think it's, it's just misery. That's what it takes. It takes misery. And you know what? I don't think I'm cut out for that kind of misery. I don't think I can be successful because I'll ne I, don't, I don't think I'll ever be able to push through that misery in order to gain success. And my message to everybody is that misery is not necessary. And in fact, if that misery is present, you're right. You will fail. So what we teach is how to be successful without being miserable in the process, mainly through the psychology and the mindset of being successful, being consistent and implementing these healthy habits, truly healthy habits, not dieting habits, but authentically healthy habits. So that's what we do. And anybody, if, if you're going to say, well, who, who are you targeting? It's anybody who wants to have a body and life they love without feeling miserable in the process. That's who we're targeting. So uh, men and women and all ages, we have people in our academy who are 17 years old all the way up to 74 years old. Um, and so uh, we, ha we have people who don't need to lose weight. We have people who are, are you know, far along in the process, but they're still kind of consumed by this poor relationship with food. And they really want to work on that where the only reason they've been successful is because they're kind of one of the unicorns that has a lot of willpower and has a lot of discipline, but it's still chaos to them. It's still not healthy to them. It's still not fun for them. And they want to escape that. So they come to us. So these are the kinds of people that, that we're working with. 
Kevin, that, that sounds awesome. I mean, I can tell people just from firsthand that you've put together a really amazing business. You've got a ton of articles out there. You're definitely shaking up the conventional norms that people think about uh, health and wellness and fitness and dieting and exercise and you know some of those key words that you said. You know, they, they're just not as relevant as what we were told they were. And you're out there really doing an awesome job trying to break through some of this stuff. You know, I really appreciated that you start your, uh, your routine, not routine, but your, uh, the rebooted body, you start that with food, you know, and you challenge people to take a look at the food that they're eating. And, you know, are, are you allergic to wheat? Are you allergic to legumes or whatever? And start cutting some of that stuff out of your diet and just, just start being aware of it. And does your body change? Do you feel differently? Are you more tired? Are you less tired? Uh, you also have a podcast, which is amazing. You know, tell people about your podcast very quickly and where they can find it. Yeah, so anywhere that you get podcasts, just go ahead and search for the Rebooted Body podcast and download that. And if for the liberty minded people, there's a couple really great episodes in there on uh, the USDA and uh, some other you know government related things. But uh, for everybody, there's just a ton, a wealth of information on all things nutrition and fitness, and most importantly, psychology. That's one of the big things I wanna get across to people is that the information side of things, the minutia, the small details, that everybody's really interested in, the sexy piece, the stuff that the health and fitness industry is always talking about. That's about 20% of your success. 80% of your success is going to come from psychology and mindset. I guarantee it. So that's the part that we focus on most at Rebooted Body. That's the difference between us and everybody else. That's what I feel is the missing link in the health and fitness industry and why there's a 95% failure rate. It's because they have everybody focused on the minutia when you really need to be focused on the big picture, the whole system, the psychology and mindset of the individual. And that's what we're providing. And the podcast is the perfect place to start with that because, you know, we've, like you said, have written uh, many great articles, but the podcast gives us an opportunity to be much more personal with that content and go deeper and bring in guests. And so I would definitely recommend starting with the podcast. Yeah. And it doesn't take a couple hundred million dollar budget for the FDA or whoever the CDC to help you form a relationship with both your mind and your body, right? Kevin's out here doing this. You can listen to his podcast for free and never pay for any of the products that he offers. And he's still going to create that high quality content because he truly cares about how your relationship with your body is. And if he can help you, I mean, I'm speaking for you here, Kevin, and, and, and tell me I'm wrong, but if his podcast could help you in any way, create that better relationship with yourself and your body. I mean, that's a win-win already. You know, even if you don't become a client, I highly recommend you become a client because he's going to help you get a tailor made type of understanding with your body that you, you're just not going to get in many other places. You're especially not going to have learned it in your public school or from your doctor or from some food pyramid or something like that. It's, it's such a serious epidemic, like you were saying, that we're going through right now. And healthcare is going to become worse and more expensive over time because it's becoming socialized. And so you got to be proactive and take care of your health now. And I'm going to go back and listen to this podcast because I think I need to hear my own words of wisdom because I don't always put them in practice. But Kevin, I really appreciate you coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. How can my audience get in touch with you? Yeah, so everything, uh, like you said, is at RebootedBody.com. So we have a ton of free information for you. And we, we love people who consume that free information. And if that information helps you, which it does, because we're getting emails all the time from people, and it's designed to help you. We go deeper in our free content than almost everybody else does in their paid content, right? So as you said, our goal is to 
change the landscape of human health. That's our bottom line goal. That starts with, of course, changing the, the landscape of human health for each individual that comes to us. Um, so the, the best way really that you can pay us, if, if you don't wanna work with us one-on-one, -on -one, the best way that you can pay us is just by sharing our message. You know, Share your favorite podcast episode, share your favorite article with people because that gets more people involved and it gets more people out of the cycle of chaos and failure and frustration that the, the mainstream or the legacy health and fit, fitness industry, as I call them, has everybody trapped in. Uh, so if you want to liberate people from that and give people more personal health, then share our message. And if you do want to work with us, we have an amazing online academy. If you think our free content is good, uh, you haven't seen anything. So till, till you're in there. And are you still doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching? I remember for a while you removed that and it was more group coaching. Just what, just give us an idea real quick of what we can expect if we sign up. Yeah, right now our one-on-one -on -one coaching is is completely full, uh, but we have our online academy and we have what's called an all-access membership. So instead of selling individual programs, we have two main programs that we offer. One is called Total Body Reboot, so that focuses on the nutrition, fitness, and self-care side of things. And then we have Decode Your Cravings, which focuses heavily on the mindset and the psychology and the relationship with food, body, and self. So for overcoming emotional eating or binge eating or using food for comfort, control, and coping, et cetera, that program focuses on that. So our all access model gives you access to all of our programs, all of our bonus materials, our forums, our user groups, et cetera, uh, and coaching as well. So we do group coaching calls. We, you know, Zach and I and Kim, we're in the group uh, interacting with people on a daily basis, really trying to work one-on-one -on -one with people through those channels, you know, on a, on a group coaching call, even though it's a group call, we're going to spend time with you as an individual on that call, going from individual to individual. So that's how people can get help from us right now. It's a, it's a completely different experience than we really see offered anywhere else in the health and fitness industry. So that would be where I would steer everybody right now. Come get an all access pass, go through our guided programs, get support from our community and from myself personally within that model. That's the best way to go right now. That sounds great, Kevin. Thank you so much. You know, property rights foundationally are derived from our ownership of ourself and from our body. And I think in order to be truly free, you, if you're going to be a free marketeer or a capitalist or a anarchist or voluntarist or whatever label you feel is appropriate for you, that freedom, the property rights, freedom aspect, you know, that has a lot to do with respecting property and what better property to respect than your own body where all property rights are derived from. Kevin, you're definitely a Liberty entrepreneur. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll send out uh, all the links. If you remember the name of that book that you mentioned, we'll add that to the bottom as well in the show notes. And yeah, keep keep going out there and doing it, man. You got a big fight in front of you against what you call the legacy health system. I love that term. Uh, yeah, just thank you so much for what you're doing. Yep, and it just popped into my head. So it's called Death by Food Pyramid. And it's by Denise Minger. And she's been on my podcast as well, if you want to listen. I think she's been on twice, if I remember correctly. But people want to search for that episode, they can go ahead and listen to it or just grab her book on Amazon. It's a, it's a great deep dive into that topic. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Take care. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Liberty Entrepreneurs, episode number 70 why everything you know about food is wrong with guest Kevin Geary. Head on over to his website, rebootedbody.com and start building a real relationship with your body so that you can live the life that you choose. Remember, property rights are the foundation of liberty and your body is where it all begins. If you appreciated this episode, then please share it with your friends and maybe even leave us a rating on iTunes or on your favorite podcast outlet all the links to share and to rate are in the show notes. And until next time, you know what to do. Keep building freedom.